Good morning, everybody. Uh, Ken Phelan here from uh, Gotham Technology Actually, wait, wait. Group with our uh, monthly, our newly minted monthly series, uh, helping our cyber professionals. And we've done some technical things in the past, and we've talked about different problems and issues. But one of the things I'm hearing a lot from people is just problems getting people, problems getting good candidates, people trying to make a move. So we thought we'd focus this on those issues. This issue is about finding, acquiring good talent in cybersecurity and also uh, if you are making a move, how to make a move correctly and for the right reason. So we uh, luckily have a couple of experts on this internal to Gotham, uh, and we brought them here today to have this conversation because they're doing a lot of work. We, our staffing department has never been more busy, uh, and we're doing a lot of work placing people and helping people get placed. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our, our guest talk today. Uh, first of all, we have, we have uh, Jennifer O'Connell, who's uh, our what is your title? You're the director of our staffing director practice. of staffing director of staffing services. Yeah. Thank. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, and we also have Neil Walker, who's who's our recruiting manager. Uh, so maybe Jennifer, just give a couple words of introduction about yourself, and you know what 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 your role is at Gotham. Sure. Absolutely. So director of staffing services. I oversee our staffing organization. Um, I arrived at Gotham just over a year ago. Um, I have 20 years in IT staffing. Um, held multiple roles throughout my career from all the way from recruiting to running sales organizations and, um, and regions. So um, it's been very exciting over the past year, continuing to build here at, at, at Gotham. And uh, I have such a strong passion for recruiting. That's sort of where I, where I grew up and um, making, you know, I really have a great appreciation for the candidate and client experience on both sides, so. It's great. It's great to have you here. I know you're doing great things. So it's it's you. I can't believe it's been a year. And I also it's, it's also like weird that you like you started in COVID. So like we've never been in an office together. So you know. It, so yeah, like, oh, yeah. I feel so connected. You know, to, to yeah, everyone. Yeah. So um, no, I mean, I, I said that from day one coming into Gotham. Everyone has just been so warm and welcoming, and that's just has continued on and allowed us to expand the team. And I, I think the team would echo that same sentiment. So it's been, it's that's been, been great. Going. Yeah. going really well and uh neil neil you i've known you for a bit longer than a year how long how long have you been at gotham i i just started my 19th year on october 20th yes happy anniversary yeah. Neil. happy anniversary that's great Thank 19 you. years yeah yeah yeah, so. yeah you've been working on that beard for about 17 of them <laughs> <laughs> but luckily it's finally come in yeah, know, so it's good. yeah yeah so, so 19 years at gotham 25 years in recruiting uh, individual contributor and uh, team lead uh, that that works with Jen on identifying opportunities and and setting strategy for recruiting efforts here at Gotham. So how did you find yourself? And I like were you like where the rest of the kids wanted to be firemen and policemen? Were you like I want to get involved with IT staffing when you were in kindergarten? Like how, like how do you it's, how do you find your way to a career career in, in IT? You know, it, it's actually kind of funny. I wanted to do uh, I actually want to get into pharmaceutical sales. Um, because that yeah. was the hotness back in the early 90s, right? And um, I wound up going, interviewing a couple of pharmaceutical sales jobs. Then they told me I should probably either get into copier sales or um, insurance sales to start. Oh. That was the foundation. That's where they're pulling people out of. I had a second, third interview in Manhattan for, for one for Xerox and, and one for U.S. Healthcare. <clears throat> and to fill in my morning, I answered an ad in New York Times uh, for IT recruiting. Uh, wind up going on that interview, getting the offer and, and skipping out on the second, third interviews that I had for the afternoon. Much to the chagrin of the recruiter that set me up, I, I just completely yeah. bailed, which would be against everything I would ever give advice for. But uh, I'm sure. Yeah. Never since. I'm, well, I'm sure, I'm sure the copy or sales industry great you. But we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're very happy to have you. Um, so let's let's talk about the, this overall situation. I mean, obviously, like I said, I, I'm just hearing a lot of it from people anecdotally. There's stuff in the thing. I mean, is is this truly like the most difficult time to hire people in your career? Is that just you know big language because we need something to talk about? I mean, what what's different about now? And I guess I'll start with you, Jennifer. What like what's different about now than than two than two years ago or whatever? Sure. I, I mean, look at look within IT, right? There's a talent shortage for sure. This has absolutely been one of the most difficult times to identify good talent, to attract good talent, given the you know the geography of everything, right? And 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 this whole new remote work situation that so many of us have found ourselves in. So 
yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, very, very competitive. Um, so it's all about, you know, the experience on both sides and it, it's working and educating the clients as to what's the right way to go about this and then working with the candidates to help them identify the right opportunity for them. So, um, and, and there's so many more passive candidates on the market today than ever before. Again, being in the situation that, we're, that everyone's in, they're entertaining a lot more opportunities than they would have before. It's a lot easier to log into a WebEx and take that interview or take that call than it would have been in, in, you know, in an office situation. And you know, the fact that there is a shortage, there's just opportunities everywhere. Or yeah, okay, I, I, like, I saw some stat that was like, you know, it's like the great resignation that like some, you know, like 48% of all employees are just, they, they're planning on leaving in the next, in the next 18 months or something like that. It was just, it was just some ridiculous number of, like you say, passive, but like they, they had decided to leave, but they weren't actively looking to leave, but they, they, were, they made the decision. I mean, is that what you're seeing, Neil? I mean, you're seeing like people, like, like, are there, are there truly people sitting around like planning to go? Yeah, well, well, that's, that's the funny thing, as Jenna mentioned, because of the, the virtual world that we live in now, gone are the days of, of having to make an excuse on where you're wearing a suit to work and you have to leave at three o'clock to go to, you know, your dentist appointment or whatever it is that people are saying. So you have a lot more passive candidates that, that are open to opportunity, but are also being recruited extensively by multiple um, clients. I mean, most of the people that we've been placing over the past 18 months have been fielding upwards of three to four offers at the same time. So they, they, there's a lot more people that are open to hearing, but might not necessarily might be kicking tires. Um, there's a lot of people that are kind of passive and it all depends really on, on their situation. But um, honestly, yeah, I, I've never seen in 25, 26 years of recruiting uh, such a market um, where there's a lack of candidates versus the, the amount of opportunities that are out there 100 percent yeah there's just a ton going on and, and i mean is it, when you say passive like what level of passivity are we talking about is are they are they does that still work like can you just sit around like look at jobs i mean are people are they are they getting the jobs so they change making are they making that tough choice to move or are they just sort of mildly dissatisfied yeah no no they are i mean and that and that kind of gets into you know, a, a little bit about what it is about their current situation. Things have changed considerably. And we were talking prior to, to this um, webinar here that that there's been a, a number of, of organizations that are trying to decide what they're going to do insofar as post-COVID uh, being on site or being not on site, right? And that being a huge determining factor on, on um, whether or not they're going to be able to get talent right? Either they're going to be hiring people, attracting people, or they're going to be a target for recruiters to take out of, depending on policies. Jen and I speak about uh, something called wound discovery. Uh, what is the candidate's wound? Why is it that they're looking? And even when they're passive, if they're willing to talk to you, it means that there is something that they are not completely satisfied uh, about their current situation um, that will get them to, to make a move, right? And, and we've, we've kind of narrowed it down to about five different wounds, and why? Like, so, so if you're out there and, and you're a hiring authority, uh, doing your wound discovery with your candidate as quickly as possible, and, and narrowing it down as to not waste anybody's time, right? So, so Jen, what are what are some of the wounds that we talked about? I also want to say too. I mean, you talk about wound discovery. I mean, in 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 a in a normal market, there are wounds, right? I think in this situation with COVID, that it, it's created wounds for individuals that may not have been there before. So all of a sudden now, um, you know, their their childcare situation or their family situation may have changed. So that's a wound that now needs to be um, you know looked at. Um, but yeah, I mean, when we talk about wound discovery, why? That what, what's the true motivation for looking? for a new opportunity. Um, we talk about technology, right? I mean, you know, that's one you and I talk about all the time. If a, if a candidate um, doesn't have an opportunity to upskill in the current environment that they're in um, and, and deal with the best of breed technology, you know, that that's certainly a situation where they're gonna be looking for a new opportunity. Yeah, it's kind of funny because a lot of the candidates are most attractive to employers are gonna be the ones that have stability in, in their organization, right? But a lot of those candidates, um, happen to some if if the organization is not proactive in in you know upping their their technical environment the candidate is one that loses marketability so so understanding we talk about um, attraction and or retention it's are you implementing the right technologies in order to retain the talent or attract the talent or again are you going to now become a, a target we've had we've had plenty of clients that when you look at a candidate, again, that's been with a company for four or five, six years, if their technology isn't keeping them there, that's going to be a serious wound for them to make a move, 
right? So if you're the type of organization that's willing to come out with the latest and greatest um, and, and really advance your technical environment, you're going to be able to, one, retain your talent and, and to attract talent. Um, so that's technology is, is a huge one in order to attract candidates. Um, some of the other things that have been going on would would, would so be- I just want to look on that though. I, would, like, I, I always think people overstress the technical skill sets. Like they get this rubric together of like, you know, I want 20 years of experience in this kind of encryption and this exact code set and this exact thing. And like, yeah. if you're really hiring for a long term, I always counsel the sort of the people that hire for Gotham and those things like, you know, skills are important, but hire for intelligence, not skills. I, I can teach skills and I can bring people, find somebody who, whatever they were doing in their organization, they were the best at it. They were the go-to person. They knew everything about it. Like find those, those people that are the, at the center of their existing organizations in terms of being the go-to people yeah. and, and stretch the skills a little bit rather than trying to like cookie cutter this into, you know, an exact you know, I need this skill set day one. They come in and write this piece of code, and I, and 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 I think as as engineer, like I'm an engineer, right? And you got, but like that, like we we're we're like looking for widgets to plug into the problem, and the, and the whole reason I became an engineer is because I don't like people. Like I, I just wanted to deal with ones and zeros, and I, so this HR thing comes as like a bad story for me because like oh no, I actually have to deal with people and understand that they have these needs and they want you know they want to be home. Like all that stuff is just sort of alien to us. So I think there's a there's there's a natural overreach, I think, on the skill set checks, which doesn't mean we sh people shouldn't be skilled, but I think we I think we over uh, overestimate or, or over 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 prioritize, you know, the, the, that skill set problem. Well, hey, the, the years of experience kills me. I don't know about you, Neil, but the, the, the you know being dead set on a certain number of years of experience. I mean, you you might have an individual that has taken on a lot more responsibility given the size of an environment and they're much more in tune with the technology within five years, as opposed to somebody maybe who's part of a larger team and, you know, it's been 10 years. So that, that, that's always like, that, that yeah. Gets... yeah, yeah, can, I, I'm sorry. What I'm seeing, and I just, just out of a conversation last week with some of the guys at Sands, to your point, what I'm seeing is a lot of times that skill set is way over listed for, the actual position like like you said you know they they need to have g pen or they need to have all these things plus a four-year bachelor's and the position is a sock level one entry yeah. right. you know well, and, it, and, it, and it, sometimes i wonder is it that the CISOs or whoever is the manager is doing the hiring is just handing off i got this job hands it off to, to recruiting and hr and they just come up with some sort of algorithm and just list all the stuff that is just insane you would be surprised how many can job descriptions there are out there. Well, I would not have a certain <laughs> skill set. And that's what you're looking at. It's the laundry list that we see. So it's really getting to the meat and the heart right. of what the actual job and you know roles and responsibilities yeah. are. And, and, and to Ken's point, I mean, I would rather have, it's like, I can teach you anything about cyber or, or technology or whatever. Give me some, I'm not interested in that 4.0. I want somebody who's like dying to learn. And somebody who's a team player, you know, who can get along with other people, because those are traits that are a lot harder to find than somebody who's willing to understand what a UDP call is. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, that's fair, Mike. I also, I also think that, like, you know, one of the problems, I think a lot of those requirements come from the teams. Like, we talk to the peers in the SOC and those people, and they, and they have this, I don't want to say it this way, but this overinflated view of themselves and their capabilities. Yeah. And they want somebody to be coming and do all that stuff. And, I, and then one of my favorite things, is like it's like the baboon culture, like the baboon interview, like they'll bring these people in and they have to sit in front of like 12 people who are going to be their peers and like get bulleted by like, they just like, throw, like baboons are just throwing poop at them. Like, well, like, do you know exactly. this, do you know this, do you know this, do you know this? And like, because they have to like meet the standard, the high standard that this, this has, and it's just, it's not positive. And, and, and yeah. certainly no candidate has patience for it. Yeah. Well, it's it, there's like a 80 20 rule. Um, if somebody has 80% of, of the skills required and has the ability to learn the extra 20%, then you're going to be attracted to that person. Like the, the problem is when you put a whole bunch of requirements, anybody that fits all those requirements probably isn't going to want to do that job because that's what they currently do. So, what is the impetus? Why would I want to do the same exact thing that I'm doing? What are you offering me different? So, when you hold fast the idea that you have to have every single thing on here, that's great for you as an organization bringing somebody on because that's the need that you have. But when you look at the other way, you're, why would anybody want that position if they're not going to be able to learn anything new? 
So, so right. that's the problem, right? Is that, well, if you're overqualified, it's even worse because you're, you're basically saying when you want this super qualified person to be a SOC level one, like to Mike's point, like you basically yeah. want to hire a Ferrari and tell them to go around the go-kart track and first gear all day, 100%. right? Yeah. Because like that, like that guy that has those skills that probably does not want to do that for eight hours a day. Exactly. So, um, but fantastic. So let me just like go back on this a little bit. I mean, so a lot of the skills generational. Right, like we, us old people are the hiring managers, and we walked, you know, uphill both ways to school in the snow, and we did all the hard things. We worked, and and we're hiring younger people who probably don't have that stuff. I mean, do you feel like there's just a like like a gap between what we the kind of work effort and 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 structures that we want to bring, and what is it is it a generational issue the way I'm point painting that in, in some way? I feel like Neil and I might disagree on this one a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, not necessarily necessarily generational. I think it just boils down to the individual and how motivated they are. And, and is, it, does this particular role cure their wound? I think in, in, you know, how exciting is the opportunity and how hard are they going to work for it? Um, Neil, I know you want to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, only because I, I think it's, I, I do think it's generational. Um, I think there's two things there to be said is that depending on where they are in their life, what is going to be of value to them versus what is of value to somebody else 10 years or 15 years or senior is just always been throughout history, right? Like I, pre I, I really crave stability. I have a wife, I have a couple of kids, I have a mortgage. I want to know that I have a job evidenced by the fact that I've been here for 19 years. Right? I'm just not, not very risk averse, right? I am very risk averse. So, so that's always been important to me. Whereas in somebody that's maybe 32 years old, that's still single, that's, that's looking for a little bit different out of life might crave something different. Now, when you talk about, and it's been beaten to death, the entire millennial generation, how different they are. The fact is they are, um, that, that the millennial generation is much more about experience, is much more about freedom, is much more about um, just being able to, to, to do things versus my generation, which is a little bit more on, again, on, on compensation and stability. It's and where I am in my life compared to where they are. So, so I think there is a big, there is a big difference. And, and Jen and I were discussing this on, on offer and offer acceptance as well. When you're, when you're talking traditionally, it's been the idea that um, people kind of hide that like one of the biggest problems that employers make when trying to hire somebody is not really letting them know that they're super interested in them. It's, it's like this weird game that's been going show on. Show your cards, them. show your cards, yeah, know yeah. how much you like them, right? Right, yeah. and it, it's been it's been like traditional that, you know, everybody's kind of like holding it close to the chest and you like me and I like you and I'm gonna make you an offer and, and, and we're gonna negotiate and whatever. Whereas, and I think the younger generation, I, I, would, I would strongly advise to just be like, hey, we really like you, we wanna move forward. Where are you in your process being super, super direct um, and letting them know that they are like appreciated or, or wanted within your organization. It's been, uh, I think that's a big cultural difference between yeah. those of us in our, our plus 40 versus under 40. I think Do we no expect too much? That. I mean, okay, Jennifer. I'm sorry, no matter what, I think people want to be, want to yeah. know and, and, and see that they have the opportunity to, to grow and be developed and thrive within an organization. I think no matter what, I think everyone needs to see that. Yeah. yeah. Do we expect too much? Of, like I, I got advice from someone the other day and they were talking about hiring and finding good people. And they were like, I won't hire. If, if I sit down with a candidate and that candidate hasn't done full research on my company, doesn't come in knowing, you know, things about my company it's an immediate non-starter and I'm like you must hire nobody I'm like I almost never see that candidate like candidates come in and they don't they maybe that's something that people used to do maybe something I would do but not it's not something that's generally done I mean are we just expecting too much of you know in terms because times have changed or you know expecting too too, too much um no, I mean, that's something that we prep candidates on all the time, time and, you know, do your research. We provide them with the LinkedIn uh, information on who they're interviewing with, a little bit of information about the company. We, we stress that to them to do their research. And yet we're still surprised by how many individuals don't do that, right, Neil? I mean, yeah. to, to, to get that feedback. And there's so many, so many hiring managers that um, will say just that. They knew nothing. They knew nothing about where we are. So I think it is that that needs to be felt on both sides too. how interested is this candidate in this opportunity and to work for this organization. Right. right. So I don't think so that's I, affecting yeah. too much. Yeah. So I love that pragmatic advice you just gave about, you know, show your cards, act differently. Than let, let's do more of that. Like what, like where are you getting can like what, what can we, how can we help 
our customers who are on the phone right now who are all, all have open positions besides obviously they can give us the staffing the recs but like what are some of the tools you guys use how do you find candidates where should people be looking for candidates like what like what are what are some of the tricks there so i mean we hear all the time from clients right now that they are engaging with their internal talent acquisition teams who are just so inundated with opportunities right which is why they're coming to us and they're looking to engage us to help in the search um, so I think it's just aligning, networking and aligning yourself with a great staffing organization and, and networking. I mean, if you're that hiring manager, how active are you on LinkedIn, right? Are you plugged into user groups? Are you, are you networking and connecting and asking others to share your opportunities? Um, Neil and I talk about this, about this all the time um, from, you know, from where to find the talent. Um, if you don't have a network within a specific vertical, I mean, it's an uphill battle. Yeah, I, th I think LinkedIn, uh, you know, having a good LinkedIn profile is critical of being a thought leader, of sharing articles, of writing articles, of, of or just like posts, just being interested in your craft. And I know, you know, a lot of hiring managers, well, they all have a full-time job that doesn't involve hiring people. But but honestly, it's, it's when you want to attract the best talent, you have to be a little bit more proactive in putting yourself out there, right? And And there is... There's alternative places. I mean, you got to go where where the people are hanging out, right? If you're talking about back in the day, there was meetups in New York City. There's a whole meetup you know, site, and and if you were interested in certain technologies, there was there was meetups going on. We had a situation where uh, we had a client that was looking to build out uh, doing a proof of concept, and they were going to be utilizing NoSQL solutions with with Scala as a programming language before Scala actually became super popular. Popular, and and there was nobody that had it on their LinkedIn profile. So I had joined a meetup group and there was a Scala meeting going on three days later in New York City. I put my name in, I got the entire list of attendees and I pinged all of them on LinkedIn. Um, found one, got them really interested, sent the resume over to the client. The client had actually gone to the meetup themselves and, and with the intention of learning more about Scala, but we're also meeting Scala talent. Bumped into the guy that he was going to be interviewing through through me, but two days later, right? So, so um, we wound up making a connection and, and he got hired, but that manager, I want to give him kudos because he took a, an, an active interest in that, put himself out there and went to meet people where they hang out, right? If, if you're hiring anything and you're looking for a good program, you, you have to have a GitHub account, right? You, you have to be looking at people that are contributing within your area that are really the thought leaders and connecting with them then on LinkedIn. So it's going to be, it's a lot of legwork and it's, just, you know, it's what we offer organizations to do that recruiting um, because not a lot of hiring managers have the time to do that. But if you're going to be looking for people, you got to go where they hang out is, is really what it comes down to. I think to Neil's point, it's work. It's a lot of work to find good talent, a lot of networking, um, you know, and there's a lot of time spent with the talent. You know, like we talked about when we first got started here today, there are so many paths of candidates out there on the market. And, you know, there has to be something compelling about that opportunity that's going to attract them. Yeah, it's about getting out there. And it, it's also like we were talking about passive candidates. You kind of want, I want the passive candidate. I don't, I don't want the guy who's a total mercenary who will always leave the job for 10% more. Like, I, you know, you kind of want to beat the bushes a little bit and, and, yeah. and get involved with that. So it's just, just work. And to your point, a lot of internal HR teams are so overwhelmed that they're, they're basically just posting. They're not really recruiting, right? They're just oh, that's, putting they're it they're out there. And those, yeah, they're posting those canned job descriptions. They're not getting the right talent. The, the hiring managers feel like their time is wasted because they're not interviewing the right people. I mean, we, we see it all, all the time. Well, that's a misconception too, that HR actually recruits, right? It, unless you have a dedicated recruiting staff within your organization, please do not assume that your HR is going out there and, and doing that. It is a small percentage of their job, again, and, it, and it's not, they don't traditionally have that sales ship that it takes to, to attract candidates too. So it's, you know, you really have to have an internal recruiter. If you don't, you should be, you should be working, you know, with an outside agency. Right. And so what the, go ahead. Sorry, no, I was going to say, it, and it's birds of a feather, right? I mean, good yeah. talent knows good talent. So it's, it's a lot of networking and, and, and referrals and yeah. right. people. Right. So, so as a person that employs a lot of technical people, like one of my big worries every day is making sure that I have retention, right? And we've, we've been lucky at Gotham to have great employee retention through a number of things. But I'd like to hear you, you guys were talking about wounds before, like, again, a lot of these people on the phone have, have staffs now, they don't want them to leave, they know that there's this great resignation, like what, what, what should, as, what, as a person that's got engineers working for me that wants them to stay, 
what should I be thinking about in terms of wounds? You, you mentioned technology before. There's probably other ones like what? Like how do I create a, a retention? You know, keep my keep my people. How do I do that? If I can quote Neil Walker, um, <laughs> I mean, we you know we talked about that. We talked about this a lot too. But um, you know, people don't leave jobs, right? They leave bad managers, yeah. right? So I mean, taking a look at you know how your your particular organization or group group is run. Um, when we talk about wound discovery, um, changes in management is is a big one for people, yeah. right? Um, if there are those changes in management, that creates a level of uncertainty where people now are yeah. entertaining opportunities. I think I think that's so true, Jennifer. Um, we had a mass exodus because of one bad manager, mm -hmm. and, and and that's the first thing I think in retention you got to look at. Um, is how are people being treated? Mm -hmm. You know, if they're treating, being treated with work, being, you know, now you've, you've hired this guy with, or this woman with all these great credentials and you're now treating them like garbage. I mean, they're, they're gone and nobody, yeah. you know, and I think a lot of people as part of this great migration are just saying, I've had enough of this. You know, we, I, we, we took a serious hit this year and fortunately, one of the people who go was one of the managers. And now you, you can see like a 180 in attitude and, yeah. one, and 180 in who's staying and like who, who's enjoying their job. Well, that, yeah, that, and it's, and it's the opposite too, right? When you lose a very good manager, right? We, yeah. had, we had a client that the, the head of uh, North American IT was leaving. The, the directors and, and C-level above that person did not really communicate downward to the other people in the organization, what the strategy was in replacing that person, right? So what had happened within three months, we saw four of the hiring managers that reported to that person leave as well, because there is a lot of opportunity because there was uncertainty. So then now we were running multiple searches for this, this company um, for lower level positions that we're, we couldn't get anybody on the management team to interview them any longer because nobody was left. So, so a big thing about that is if, if you're within a, an organization that has a very well-liked and, and well-respected manager leave, you, you have to be super cognizant of the fact that that uncertainty, some people would have been only going to, were working there specifically because of that manager and, and other people are going to be a little bit unsettled and are much more apt to leave. So my advice on retention in that sense is, is to make sure you're communicating as much as possible. Right, because if if there's no if there's no leader that's conveying that that confidence that everything's going to be okay, then you should expect probably a lot more people to leave. Oh yeah, people are creating their own narrative, and yeah. most of the time it's not it's not good if they're not receiving that, that oh, message. Yeah. The other the other thing too, I mean, talk about you know mass exodus in in this whole COVID world, right? Is the quality of life. You know, things change for 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 people. So when you're really considering quality of life and, and what is afforded to you in that opportunity, that's another big wound that, that uh, we see. Yeah, if, yeah, I if, think definitely now. Yeah, if, if real, yeah. the ability to be flexible, um, I, strong advice is to do that. I mean, we had an outstanding candidate who had a special needs child that they needed to drop off every day at nine o'clock, right? The, the client saw the, the talent in this person was like, you know what, if you need to start your day at 10 o'clock, then, then that's perfectly fine, but we've had that in the past where clients wouldn't do that. We've had people lose opportunities because of their, their situation. So the companies that are as flexible as humanly possible regarding people's personal situation are the ones that are gonna get the most talent. That's, that's a huge thing. It's, it's a main motivator for a lot of candidates that are looking when companies are not being flexible about that. And Neil, that's a big one that you hit on with work location now where some companies are looking to bring people back to the office. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of candidates out there that are not interested in going back and are certainly not interested in going back on a, on a, a full-time basis. Yeah. So, well, so Ken Stat, you know, when, when we were talking offline before, you know, 90% yeah. of CEOs want people in the office, 90% of employees don't want to be in an office. There has to be, you know, it, it's not just saying that employees run amok, right? But there, there has to be some kind of compromise at this point. And it's, it's funny, we'll have um, our salespeople bring in requisitions and the clients that are super you know, inflexible about allowing people to, to, to have some flexibility in their, in their um, job location or, or work hours and that kind of thing are the ones that are, are getting kind of put a little bit more aside because if I have four opportunities and we do, we have, we have multiple opportunities that same skill set across multiple clients, the differentiator is going to be this, right? And that in comp, 
obviously, right? Which is, which is the last one, right? And and I guess Jen and I were talking about this before. If if you advice to to people out there is is really to kind of test the market and see what what compensations are being paid by your um, competition. So if you're getting resumes and you're looking at it and you're like, you know, this person bounced and they had four different jobs in the last six years and I'm not super interested in them. It might, it might behoove you to, to, to converse with them for a half hour to find out what it is, like what did, you know, you can't really ask people about compensation history as much anymore, but, but there's a lot more people that are willing to share that and, and get a little bit more market intelligence about what your salary band should look like within your organization. And, and I would honestly tell you, if, if you have talent that you're looking at that is on your team that you do not want to lose, be honest with yourselves and, and figure out if you're, if you really like them because you're getting a good deal on them, right? You're underpaying them a little bit. They could probably get more in the market. I would advise giving them a raise before they ask for it, because if they're asking for it there, that means they're, they're out there considering other opportunities because they're getting calls from recruiters um, that are paying substantially more. So I think it's, again, you know, you got to take the hit to retain. It's, it's costs a lot more to recruit than it does to retain. So I would look at your team and be like, Hey, you know, we've actually been getting a good deal on this person. They've been here for five years. Why are we not paying them more? Um, I think there's a big misconception too. If that wound really is money at mm -hmm. the end of the day, it just boils down to money. I think there's a big misconception that, well, we'll just give them more vacation time or we'll just, you know, let's talk about the benefits that we have. That's not going to cure that wound. So it's never going to work. We had a, um, a situation recently with a client that just did just that new going in interviewing what the salary requirements were of this candidate. And they came back in the 11th hour to renegotiate and with a low ball offer and talked about all the wonderful benefits that they had. And it just at the end of the day wasn't wasn't going to work because the motivating factor was was money, was salary requirements. Yeah. So. No, it's definitely a tough situation. I mean, everyone's doing those reviews and doing that, th those elements. But I think, look, to me, I think the culture thing just looms large. I mean, we, we do 360s, I tell everyone. And, and, and if your organization doesn't do 360s because you're scared to get that feedback, then that's a, that's a, that's a newsflash too, right? If you, if, if you yeah. can't fix the culture part and have those kinds of lines of communication, you're just, you're just not going to get anywhere with with retention or, and to your point, even if you hire people, they're just going to walk back out again. Sure. Like you're going work, you're to work so hard to get these unicorns through the door and they're, and they're just going to take one look at it and, and, and go out the other door. Yeah. So, um, I guess, do you have, we were talking about the money part. I mean, it being part of the issue, not like the whole issue. I mean, it is it, like, is there like, what do you guys use? Like what judge, like what, what are the right salaries? What are the wrong? I mean, how, how do you kind of come, because I think that's a, that is sort of black. You're you're saying you can talk to other people, but I mean, what you know, I, I just I find that to be one of the more challenging parts, particularly because again we're hiring technical people, and you made this point like if they've asked you, it might be too late already. Like these mm -hmm. people are not. It's sales guys will come and ask for you know a raise every day just as a matter of course. <laughs> um, but the technical people like that they, sometimes they build, it builds up. Like how do you create that line of communication? I guess go back to the culture thing with your employees so that you have that that kind of trust that maybe isn't natural to use a technical manager or a technical employee? I mean, at the risk of sounding cliche, I think it's a human connection, right? It's being connected to your employees and understand what, what's, what motivates them. It's not the same answer for, for everyone, right? To, right. to, to right. be plugged into what, what is important to them. And then, you know, just even these HR organizations, we're seeing like never before, they're, they're taking a look and revisiting these salary bands and reclassifying and rewriting job descriptions. And especially in this whole digital world that we're in, right? And, and raising the salaries that are more in line with, with that, that particular skill set. Well, companies also have, a, you know, we see the opposite as well, right? We also are seeing companies that are hiring people that are remote and then getting a better deal, right? So, so New York salaries are, are based on um, cost of living around here being a little bit more. So if you're willing to have a 100% remote job, you can hire some good talent in other states where the cost of living is not as high. And then they start to compensate down. I think, like, what is it? Uh, Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan was talking about that. Like if, if you are looking in New York and you want to move somewhere and, and continue to work for us, expect your salary to drop because we're paying compensations based on um, local to, to the New York market versus cost of living in say Kansas or, or Montana or wherever, right? So, so yeah. you can strategically look at it that way that if we're not going to be needing somebody to come on site, then let's really start to look at alternative locations that might be a lot more affordable. Um, 
just a thought. Probably. So let's just change gears a little bit. So if you if, if we were hiring for hiring people or we've got growth we've got retention, we're hiring people. What does the, what what mistakes do customers make or people make when the, during the hiring process they, yeah. that they can fix and get and get yeah. a better more, more better candidates or, yeah. or, or 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 fix that? Like what 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 can people do for that? Well, one thing I will say to quote Jen O'Connell, uh, time time kills all deals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that so go on, Jen. You yeah, I, you I mean it, so. that's it. Thank you for that tea up there. Yes, time kills all deals. You'll hear me say that multiple times a day, probably. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think it's it's being consistent and engaging through the entire interview process, and I think a lot of clients make the mistake of not staying engaged or taking too long to really streamline the interview process because these candidates are being distracted with other opportunities that are coming their way. And if somebody's showing a greater interest and in keeping them more engaged throughout, you know, that could potentially be the opportunity that that's, that's going to, to win out. So that that's a big one delaying the interview, but, you know, understanding the client that the candidates timeline, you know, when are they looking to make that move and staying, staying engaged? Um, I think lack of transparency too, right now and, and, and feedback, uh, you know, it goes back to showing your cards, let them know how interested you are. Yeah, I mean, they, we've been talking about candidate experience for for the better part of I don't know five six years has been a buzz in, in our in our field for for a little bit, and it's the idea that you know if, if we're talking specifically about um, say IT security within New York City, the community is is quite small. There's not a lot of, of serious experts, right? And and what ha and everybody knows that because it's very difficult to hire them. So, so the situation is if you're the type of organization that is not being transparent with a candidate or not respecting their time or ghosting you know, them, it, it, like having them come in for two or three interviews and then not giving feedback and just going with a different candidate and not closing that loop, that candidate is going to talk about you to their colleagues. It is, you know, when, when they're saying, hey, I'm going to go interview at XYZ, I'd be like, really? You know, I just interviewed there like two months ago. They're a bunch of jerks. Like they, they didn't get back to me. Like I'd interviewed there a couple of times. And if they respect each other and know that they're good, that that's going to, they're going to take that endorsement from, from their coworker uh, a lot higher than they are in, in the recruiter or the HR person that's trying to sell them on it. Because it's like, hey, I just had a friend of mine interview over here and, and I hear it's terrible. We've had that before with, with clients um, where we speak to candidates and they say, hey, listen, you know, no, I don't want to work at XYZ. I have a good friend that works over there says it's terrible. The entire experience is terrible. So people absolutely talk. And, and it's if you're going to reject somebody, you just got to be uh, you know, upfront with them. Just say, hey, listen, we found somebody else that has uh, better fit our needs at this current time. It was a pleasure meeting you. Maybe we can collaborate in the future. Something like that, which just kind of closes the loop. It takes the onus off of it being the candidate's fault. There's just someone else that happens to have a very similar background of what we need right now, a little bit more than you. And, and it leaves it with a kind of a, a positive experience that when their colleague says, I'm going to interview XYZ, like, yeah, those guys are actually pretty cool. You know, unfortunately, I didn't be there. Just wasn't the right fit. But yeah, I would recommend them. Huge, goes a huge, huge way. Um, and, and you can save a lot of money by not having to overpay for talent in the future that normally wouldn't work for you because, you know, they heard bad things about the, the employee experience or the candidate experience at that yeah. time. Let's, I mean, the candidate's going to get that interview experience, and they're going to extrapolate that into your entire culture, right? So they're they're going to see that 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 small keyhole and think the whole thing. And I was I was talking to somebody who was a technical salesperson, but he was interviewing with this company, and it was like you know the seven trials of Sinbad. That was like the fiery hoop after fiery hoop, and they want you to create a proposal, and they need you to give it, they need you to do a presentation in front of thirty people, and they're like all these different things. And, and, he, and he basically dropped out of the whole process and said, if, if this is the, you can hire me or not, but I'm not doing any of those things because if that's the culture, I don't want to be part of it. Because if yeah. that's that way you interview, that's the way you're going to operate your org. And I, and, and I, don't, I don't need that BS in my life at this time. Yeah. And I think, and, and I think people, get, again, we're, we're trying to get the best candidates through these trials by fire and, mm -hmm. and we're disincenting people. People don't want to work in a place where it's trial by fire every day. We, we tell clients all the time, I mean, when you're interviewing talent, bring your A game, you know, that, that's a big question when we're, when we're engaging with clients and we ask why, why your organization, why this opportunity and why you as a hiring manager and, you know, you're going to sell that experience to the candidate. You're going to, you're going to give them the opportunity to see what they're, what they're walking into and what they're, you know, what the opportunity truly is. We, we just had a client within the last four months that we had two candidates in the process hang up 
in the middle of an interview and, and another one after the interview, saw the interview through and came back and said, I would never work with that person. They are the rudest human being I've ever met. And, and it was somebody that was doing a technical interview and the, the leadership, and it was like the third interview in, right? So the leadership was completely, you know, kind of taken aback. We had wound up getting on the phone with the human resources to discuss this particular person within the organization. Turned out that person had a bunch of complaints from coworkers about them. Um, and, and we were shocked that they were even having them in because they are the face of the organization when they're doing the interview and, and kind of completely remove that person from that process going forward. But it was, it was pretty, you know, it was kind of indicative of that, that particular company that they would have this person speaking to candidates when they know that they weren't able to get along with other people. So be real careful on who's on your interview team because these are the, this is the face of the organization. And Ken, to your point, it is, it is a, that, it's very indicative of the, the organization as a whole and how they view, you know, themselves if they're if they're pulling the wrong person into the interview process. So it's something when people interview at Gotham, I, I have them give a Ken disclaimer if they have to interview with me. They're, they're, I'm like, just tell them I'm only going to spend ten minutes and be mostly distracted. I could talk about just about anything. Who knows? Like pizza? <laughs> who knows? It's like don't you know? Don't don't judge the organization based on Ken. There are much. There are a lot of nice people here. You know, it's not all me. But, well, that was like it's funny you said that because we. He's had, not lying, by the way. He is no. not lying. <laughs> but it is funny. We just had a situation where um, we had the, a client whose HR wasn't necessarily talking to the hiring manager, and the, they mm -hmm. weren't on the same page. The HR was looking for um, hour-long blocks for interviews within this person's calendar, couldn't find it. And it would take them six, seven, eight, nine days out to get an interview in. And, and on the flip side, the manager was only speaking to candidates for 20 minutes. So all they really needed was a half hour block. They were losing a ton of candidates in the process because the market was hot and by not being able to schedule that. Now on the flip side, when we're telling a candidate that there's an hour long block and they're only interviewing for 20 minutes, the candidates are walking out of this situation saying I must have bombed because I only was there one third of the time allotted for the interview. I don't think the manager liked me and started writing off the opportunity. Meanwhile, they were doing great, but they had already yeah. convinced themselves because of that thing. So really the communication between the hiring authority and the human resources there was not aligned. And it actually one of our, our junior recruiters is the one that picked up on it and was, was educating the HR on this is what your issue right now is. And they right. finally got together to talk and, and make it a little bit more realistic, right? So a candidate, if you're scheduling an hour for a candidate and you're only taking, your intention is only take 20 minutes, by all means, schedule that for a half hour because candidates yeah. are walking out of that being like, I must have done terrible. And it takes all the, the, the wind out of the sails and, and you're going to have a much harder time getting that person re-engaged with you when they don't feel the love right from the start. You know, you know that's a good point. And it, I think it comes down to being respectful of time too. And there have been numerous situations where, an interviewer does not show up to the interview. And that leaves a really bad taste in the candidate's candidate's mouth, you know, to reschedule that and 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 you know schedule the time again. It's it's you have to be respectful of their time for sure. For sure. Yeah. So let me just ask a lot of a lot of uh, the my customers, people are talking to, have specific targets for hiring women and minorities that they're you know they're they're behind in the April. They really seriously want that. Do you have any specific suggestions for? You know, obviously we said it's already hard to find these people. It's it's, yeah. it's and and those people are, are even more difficult to find. But like, what, any specific suggestions for how for how to approach that, or you know, what, what to talk about and do that well? I mean, I think we saw a lot of women right leave the workforce again in this whole COVID world that we're in. For a lot of them, family obligations. Um, you know, daycare situations, whatever it might be, and companies are trying to woo them back. We had a company um, engage us on a search for um, a cybersecurity, I think was the role, Neil, if yeah, it was a, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. um, specifically wanting to hire a woman for that role and double the placement fee to, you know, to have us focus on that role and, and, and bring, bring a woman in. But I think it come, it really boils down to what are you doing within your organization to show those individuals how they can be supported and developed in your environment. It's not just about, oh, I want to go out and hire this. What are you doing within your organization to show them that they're going to be developed and supported? Yeah, so it's, that's a big one. It's kind of funny that, you know, when we talk about women in particular within IT, if, if you look at it and, and why is it that there's, if to differentiate yourself, like if, if you're having trouble attracting those people to your environment, then what is it about your environment that you can change in order to attract them over, right? I, my wife had, had worked um, at NBC doing sales for for the better part of 15 years. And what had happened was hired right out of school, went as a, a planner, 
did that in, in, in the daytime, then did it in prime time, then became a sales assistant in daytime, then sales assistant in prime time, then a salesperson in uh, daytime, then, and then ultimately the, the top end there was a was salesperson in prime time. That took 12, 13 years, right? So in that time, she went from 22 to, to married and, and children, right? So her life had changed just in the time where they had invested everything in her to learn their entire book of business and to get it going is when she's at the time where she needs a pause. So what they did, um, they have a job share program over there where you have one woman with children that works Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and another one Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They work together on Wednesdays and compare both. They pay 60% based on you're working three days a week, but you're actually getting a lot more because when they're not in the office, they're working harder. You retain them during the time that they um, that they need to, to be more active within their, their child's development at home. And then when that those children are, are kind of up and running, so to speak, they step into a more full-time role and they allow the next generation to kind of come in. So they developed an entire program um, that really seemed to work for them in order to retain women and attract women to work there versus other organizations where, where they wouldn't be afforded that, right? So they also had on-care day site, uh, I mean, on-site daycare. So, so there's a lot of things. If you think about what are the roadblocks toward, um, toward women being able to uh, advance within their career, a lot of it is going to be you know, personal and home related as being primary caregivers traditionally, not always, but traditionally. And, and what could you do as an organization to alleviate some of the stress on them for that? And, and I think it goes well beyond that too. And, and what I mean by showing them that they can be developed and supported, what does your leadership team look like? Is it, is it yeah. diverse, right? Can they actually see the opportunity and, and know that they're going to be supported and see themselves ultimately on that career path within your organization? I think that's, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. One, of, one of my daughters is in technology. She's graduating uh, from school, but, she, but she's very vocal on this subject. She's like, wake up and smell the toxicity. Like if, if you're <laughs> seeing this problem, like yeah. stop, stop whining that, you know, the women just aren't doing it and just, you know, do a little self-evaluation of yeah. your culture and, right. and, and what, what it would mean to look like. Right. And, you know, and, and be honest, right. During the interview process, if, if that's not what your leadership team looks like, and that's the direction you want to go in it, be transparent, be honest and let them know that you're looking to engage them to help them create, you know, a, a, a different environment, right. A, more, a, a better environment. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're actually, doing great here, but we're coming up in the hour. I mean, so do we have a couple of words maybe for people who are listening who are potentially candidates, like thinking about switching jobs? Like what, like what, are, what are some of the steps? Let's, let's say that we're taught, let's say that 48% of the people on this call are passively thinking about switching jobs. Right. What, what, should they, what, what should they be doing? What, what, act, what activity should they undertake? Like what, what's gonna make for them, you know, finding an effective next job? I think first and foremost is really be honest with yourself as to why you're looking for another opportunity. Really, what is your what is your wound? Because then you're going to once you have the answer to that, then you're going to identify the right opportunity. Right. So I think that's a great a great starting point. Find yourself a good recruiter. <laughs> <laughs> How do you find a recruiter you trust? I, 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 come on, you got to be kind of salesy. Like, how do you find? Yeah. I mean, can you trust your recruiter? How do you find when you can trust? Yeah. Yeah. Neil, can I trust you? No. There's, 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 yeah. there's, there's, Neil, I'm going to kick this to you because there's two types of recruiters, right? There's a recruiter that's just looking to make the placement. So yeah. they just kind of want to, you know, maybe square peg, round hold it, round, round hold it and say yes. Or there's a, a recruiter that, that's looking to engage and have a long-term relationship with you and really help you identify the right opportunity. Right. I mean, that you'll, you, you should be able to know that within the first 10 minutes of a, of a phone call with a recruiter, right? If they're, if they're making assumptions and pitching a job at you, not knowing anything about your motivation, not knowing anything about your background, about your aspirations or anything of that sort, and they just start talking to you about, hey, I got this great job over, over at my client and I can make a whole bunch of money if I place you, right? If they're just constantly like hitting you with questions to satisfy the job requisition that's in front of them, that's not a recruiter you want to work with, right? They, a good recruiter should be calling you and just trying to find out, honestly, like wound discovery, we talk about like what it is that's motivating you to even have a conversation with me. And, and then what are your aspirations? What are you looking to do? When you're evaluating jobs, it's not only the job that, that they're talking to you about, it's, it's where are you three and a half to four years from now when you make the next move? Is that going to be a springboard toward where you got to go? Is it a lateral move? And it's a lateral move could be fine depending on your current situation, right? But in order to, you, you got to... <laughs> As Andy Meyer once uh, called us on, on the recruiter side, you guys are coin operated, right? We're, we're here to make 
money. Like there, we are a sale, so you can trust a recruiter the same way you trust a, a realtor that sold you a home, right? There's going to be good ones. There's going to be bad ones. But does this person really have an honest, like, will they have an honest conversation about you and, and where you are in your career and what's going to be right? If they're pitching CTO positions to you and, and you're an eight-year kind of person, then, then they don't really care to listen or, or being completely transparent or honest with you about, about where your value is in the market, right? So, so my advice is interview the recruiter, talk to them, and especially about the opportunities that they're, so say you get to liking a recruiter, talk to them. Do they have a direct relationship with the manager? What other people have they placed within our organization? Do they have success there? Where are they, you know, what are their points of contact within there? Tell me about the last few positions that you've placed within that company, or, or tell me about people with my background that you've placed recently. They should be an expert within the, the technology or within, you know, so the field in general, of, of where it is that they're pitching you. So, so yeah, you can trust recruiters, not all of them, just like every human yeah. being, right? But I would, my advice really is, is to see how they approach you and, and then how they answer the questions that you have for them and determine that. Yeah. Best way to do it, look on LinkedIn, right? To talk to, talk to colleagues. So, I mean, everybody's getting pinged with calls about, of, you know, about opportunities. Talk to your colleagues about who, who they enjoyed working with in the past. It's always good. Yeah, but it's I get asked a lot of coaching questions. Like people come to me, like I'm thinking about making a move. I want to do stuff. It's probably more senior people, but I always, yeah. you know, one of my coaching comments is always like, think about what you're going to do every day, yeah. and whether you like because because a good career is just really a string of good days. Like think about the activities that that make you happy during the day. day and once you because to me, it's like I'm talking to you, like everyone wants to be a CISO. I'm like, okay, you do know that almost all CISOs are miserable, right? Because like <laughs> like what their day is comprised of, and, and maybe you. Maybe you like that. Maybe it's a fit for you that, you're, that you want to hear big problems all day long that are very difficult, that are not within your power to actually solve. Maybe that's, maybe that's what you want to do. But, but I think people like look at that ladder and I think they, they make themselves miserable sometimes by not thinking about what, it, what is it that really feeds you. Like that yeah, sounds sound we, hokey, but like. We tell candidates all the time, if you can write, a, write the job description for your next opportunity, what does that job description look like? And I think you it just comes to you and in, in what you, what you want to be doing, where you see yourself. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, sure. All right. Any other like, thought? I mean, I don't know if there's any questions in the group. We're just about up on the hour here and seeing where this, if there are any questions, they can certainly type them in or send them out to us or turn your mic off. I think that seems to be working for some people. Do you guys have any like last thoughts or closing comments or things that you think people, you know, need to know? No, no. One thing no, I would just say during yeah. the inter during the interview process, right? It's in, in terms of being engaging, it's so hard to to have that human connection, you know, when you're in this virtual WebEx or you know environment, and it's just bringing the energy and being engaged during an interview, not being distracted and 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 coming prepared and asking questions because you know you're gauging if it's a fit on both sides. So it makes makes clients a little nervous if you're not asking questions. Yeah. I think it's good to have somebody have the job of presenting the company. Like, so like, like when we, have, when we have multiple interviews, like we always try like share notes of like, okay, whose, whose job is it to really like to pitch Scott? I'm going to talk about the company, the structures, like who's going to play that role in it. So someone else is going to tech you out a little bit. Somebody might do this, do that, check your consulting skills, but it's gotta be somebody's job to spend the time and energy of, of, of to kind of sell the company to the candidate. Right. Yeah. Not everybody can show up. To yeah. that. No. Somebody's that way everybody's not just repeating themselves throughout the entire process. Right. Um, right. Yeah, right. hundred percent. Hi, well, awesome. This has been great fun, guys. Thanks. I, it's, it's great to be talking to people Thank that I've worked with for 19 years and a year. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be posting this. If anybody has any questions, be, definitely feel free to reach out. Uh, Jen and Neil are available. If they're giving uh, interviews and, and autographs after the show. So they'll, they'll be hanging out. Um, but we appreciate your time. And everybody have a great day. Thanks, everybody, for joining.